Join one of Virginia's oldest and most experienced personal injury law firms as we explore how the law does and doesn't work, the art of leadership, and the power of community. Now, here are your hosts, Peter Burnett and Jonathan Slater. Today, unlike a lot of other days of uh, episodes that we do about very interesting people in the community, we're going to switch over to the weeds of the law, so to speak. Yeah, Professor that, Burnett uh, is going to make an appearance here today. <laughs> yeah, well, as close as I'll ever become to being a professor, and, and, and we'll see what grade that uh, my student gives the professor as opposed to vice versa. <laughs> How about that? Uh, we're going to talk about principally contributory negligence. And the reason that that's a topic of interest is that there are only four states left in the United States and plus the District of Columbia that have the doctrine of contributory negligence. It is a very harsh doctrine in the law that truly penalizes many, many, many claimants who really ought to be compensated for the injuries they suffered in any number of kinds of accidents as applies to car accidents, slip falls, various kinds of product liability, medical malpractice, you name it. It's, it's more prevalent in some forms than others. But contributory negligence is basically... Uh, limited to those four states because if the claimant is contributorily negligent in his or her accident, the law says that that individual is not entitled to collect anything, nothing. So a claimant could be 2 or 3 or 5% at fault and the accident be 95% the fault of the other guy and the claimant gets zero, and the other guy basically walks away. The rest of the United States, over the course of the last 50 or 100 years, has corrected this, what I would characterize as a Puritan-based form of penalty for contributory negligence, uh, by creating what's called comparative negligence, and there are essentially two kinds of comparative negligence. Pure comparative negligence, which is how it came out initially, is simply comparing the negligence, and which is a finding of the jury if the case should go to trial, and dividing up the agreed-upon damages in accordance with that attribution of, of negligence. To, to put it a different way, or to give an example, if someone is 15% at fault, in a case that they have found to have a value of $100,000 in damages and the defendant is found to be 85% at fault, then the defendant or his insurance carrier pays $85,000 and the claimant, the plaintiff, is stuck with or is responsible for his or her own 15% of damages. That became... Uh, changed or that 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 got modified uh, after it had been enforced for a while uh, to well there are still some states i think there's quite a few states that uh that use pure contrib or, or pardon me uh pure comparative fault sure aren't there Yes, yep. there, there are many states that use it, uh, but there are, then there are other states that have... Modified. Right. And the modified fault. means, it's real simple, it, it's just that the defendant has to be at least 50 or 51% at fault. That is, the person who's making the claim, the plaintiff, the claimant, typically our client, can't be more than half at fault. Right. And if, and if they are more than half at fault, they can't bring any claim. Right. right. And so under pure comparative fault... Technically, the plaintiff could be 90% at fault and the defendant 10% at fault. Right. And, and still be able to recover. Yes. And, and I think it was probably thought in the early days that the free market, if you will, would determine that answer. And when I say determine that answer, what I really mean is that someone's not going to bring an action for $5,000 for themselves 
in a case that's worth $100,000 because they were 95% at fault and 5% free of fault and therefore would be entitled to 5% from the other guy. They're not going to bring that action. It, it's right. the, the economics don't make sense. But and at least it gets, you know, the, the modified is a good is a good arrangement and maybe in the states that still have pure comparative negligence, uh, it works itself out. But it's darn sure better than what we've got here in Virginia. I'll take pure or modified over contributory. Negligence. Any day. Any day. And with all respect to this great commonwealth of ours, some states are, are uh, more quick than others to modernize their laws. And unfortunately, Virginia sometimes tends to lag behind. <laughs> well, John knows what's coming next for me on this one. It's going to be my little, my little question of how many... How many Virginians does it take to change a light bulb? It takes three. It takes one to change the bulb and two to talk about how great the old one was. Yeah. And that's where we are, I think, with contrib. We've even had members of the legislature say, gee, juries are already practicing comparative negligence. If there's a little bit of negligence on the part of the plaintiffs, they just ignore it. Well, that's no way to have the law actually operate. We, we don't want it operating in the shadows or operating in a way where people are really twisting what the real law is and then ignoring it and saying that that's a good solution. But let me just provide from our jury instructions, which are pretty straightforward and have been time-tested by many appellate courts, including the Virginia Supreme Court. They're, they're a state of Virginia model jury instructions. And it starts with negligence. A lot of people may wonder how negligence is defined. And these instructions are what the judge would read to a jury at the end of the case before they would go out and deliberate so that they have some guidance on terms of how to define things, how their decision-making process should be, go should be handled in hopes that they won't pepper the court with questions as they're deliberating. Now, the court always invites jurors, if they have questions, to have the foreman write down a question and give it to the bailiff to take back to the court. And the court then shares that with counsel. And if they have can come to an agreement as to how the question should be answered and if it should be answered, that's what happens. If, if, it, if they can't come to an agreement, then the judge makes a decision and the question is either answered or not answered or partially answered. In my experience, usually the answer to that question from the bench is you have the jury instructions. Yes. Sometimes they'll ask a question that's already in the jury instruction. For example, does our decision have to be unanimous? Um, and depending on the judge, there's some discretion there. The judge may reread the the instruction or point them to the instruction. They they take the instructions back into the jury room with them in Virginia. Uh, but that yes, they, they instructions can be at the heart of jury deliberations. Many a trial lawyer has a fair amount of angst that the jury gives them any attention at all. They tend to be rapid fire thrown at them and there are in most cases 15 to 20, let's say, instructions, many of them standard, routine, boilerplate type of instructions, and then four or five, six of them that are specific to the evidence in the case. Which are the ones that you need to be careful about because those are the ones that you end up arguing on appeal. That's right. The, the, as you know, the, 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 that's a fertile ground for whether it be the claimant or the, the defendant, whoever's losing uh, after the case is over, is looking for some way to say, I didn't get due process, and jury instructions are one of the first places that they look. And, of course, uh, there's a process of arguing jury instructions before they're ever submitted to the jury, and, and in the way the law works, the trial counsel has to object at the time they're offered and preserve that objection and that's just routine for good lawyers and sometimes they prevail on an instruction they may the instruction may not adequately fit the evidence that came in and the supreme court says do it again hard to say but here these this is pretty straightforward with with the negligence let me just read the the one short sentence two short sentences of how negligence is defined it's jury instruction number 4.0 in virginia Negligence is the failure to use ordinary care. Ordinary care is the care a reasonable person would have used under the circumstances of this case. So that's pretty understandable. It's what 
a reasonably prudent individual would do under the same or similar circumstances. So that if, if most people would not drive over 40 miles an hour, even though it's a 55 mile an hour zone because it's wet and icy and they determined that the defendant was driving 50, even though that individual was inside the speed limit, an ordinary person would adjust as is required by law in Virginia, his or her driving to the conditions of the roadway. And if the jury determined that the conditions of the roadway and the reasonable prudence of a driver would limit them to going only 40 miles an hour, then they can find that the driver was negligent even though he or she was inside the speed limit. So then let me move to contributory negligence. Contributory negligence is the failure to act as a reasonable person would have acted for his own safety under the circumstances of this case. Now, it really is not any different than primary negligence. The, the difference is that contributory negligence has to have some foundation in the evidence separate and apart from the primary negligence of the defendant. Major distinction is contributory negligence is somebody other than the defendant contributing negligence to the happening of the event. And if it happens to be another tortfeasor, another defendant, some other person, that is two or three or four people are responsible for injury to the claimant, the plaintiff, our client, that is not considered contributory negligence. That's part of the primary negligence. And it has no reflection on the conduct of the plaintiff. Contributory negligence refers to the plaintiff, the person that was hurt and who's making the claim, because if it is found, then that claimant is not entitled to any recovery whatsoever. So, for example... I'm trying to think of what would be a, a good example in terms of driving. If the plaintiff is driving his or her car on an icy road above the speed limit at a time when they should have been able to stop uh, when they saw the defendant going through a stop stoplight that he should have stopped for, then it might be found that that plaintiff's excessive speed under the circumstances contributed to the happening of the accident. And if the jury so finds, then the plaintiff's going to be deprived of that, any recovery whatsoever. There's another piece in this that when people start pulling this apart, it, it kind of comes to mind and... John, I'll see if you agree with me on this, and that is the notion of proximate cause. Where do you draw the line in terms of what the cause of any given accident or other injurious circumstance is? For example, if the person who was in a car accident on the way to work had not decided to go to work that day, then the accident wouldn't have happened. So isn't the fact that the person that decided to go to work that day, like they do every day, a proximate cause of the accident happening? Well, I think most people would say, in a sense, yeah, that's, that's a cause of it. You have to, had to be there for it to happen. But the law puts a definition on proximate cause, which, which draws uh, some, some lines about it. And the way it's defined, and we'll talk about it a little bit, is instruction number 5.0. A proximate cause of an accident, injury, or damage is a cause that in natural and continuous sequence produces the accident, injury, or damage. It is a cause without which the accident, injury, or damage would not have occurred. And then in parens after it says there may be more than one proximate cause of an accident, injury, or damage. We won't worry about getting into those weeds at the moment. But so the proximate cause, it has to be something that naturally in its normal circumstances is going to cause the accident. So going to work or getting into one's car or driving on the highway that day or driving the speed limit in and of itself isn't something that's going to cause the accident. It has to be that 
the proximate cause has to be that offensive conduct, that conduct that is dangerous. That, that renders it reasonably foreseeable. That's another way of putting it, yes. And I think uh, kind of foreseeabil- the- foreseeability is a big discussion in the law and is often the subject of argument as to whether or not some damage or injury should have been foreseeable. Right. What it reminds me of, John, is, is, and I think you might have been involved, involved in one of these cases, and because there's a lot of them out there, unfortunately, are a couple of high, high school kids who haven't had their driver's license for long racing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, is it the, what the one driver says, well, I'm a good driver. Uh, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just racing and, and he hit me. Well, isn't it foreseeable that you're speeding at that speed at night trying to watch out for cops and with the radio going and a couple friends in the car and maybe even something that has a little alcohol in it involved that there's it's foreseeable that an accident might well happen so at that point all of a sudden you're maybe contributing to the happening of that accident in one form or another or and a whole other doctrine called assumption of the risk, you're taking the chance that an accident is or isn't going to happen and that a reasonably prudent person, back to this notion of what negligence is, would not do that. Mm-hmm. And so your engagement in racing might well be seen in, in by many a jury as being contributory negligence because you were participating in the event which foreseeably could hurt somebody right right and how am well, i doing john i think you're doing you're, you're doing great and I, I think it would be a natural place to transition into how this notion of a causal nexus applies to contributory negligence because there does have to be a a causal relationship between the alleged contributory negligence and the accident itself for instance, if uh, somebody is sitting behind the wheel of their car in traffic and, and they're intoxicated and they get rear-ended, is there a causal nexus between that person's intoxication and them getting rear-ended? I'm going to say no. Perhaps uh, simpler or a different vari- a variation on that is a person got their headlights out at night and they're at a stop sign, but the taillights are working perfectly. Right. And the guy that comes up behind him is not only speeding, but he's distracted looking at his telephone. And a reasonably prudent person would have seen the taillights on and would know by looking above the car in front of him that that person has stopped at a red light uh, and wouldn't strike him. Right. Uh, so is the fact that the plaintiff's headlights were out uh, a contributing factor? No. Now, if his taillights were out, now we're talking a different story. Maybe that driver should have seen that car, should have seen between the stoplight being there and that there was something in front of him. And it's interesting, in Virginia, we're not required to drive at a speed that we can stop within the distance of our headlights. But nonetheless, we're charged with providing sufficient distance from foreseeable dangers that we don't get into accidents and we don't harm others. And so if you add to the mix that the person's taillights were out, but maybe the driver should have seen the accident coming, now you've got a classic argument for the jury to decide. That's a jury question. Were the facts of the lights being out on the plaintiff's vehicle a proximate cause of the accident happening and was the driver of the vehicle with the lights out who got hurt because he got rear-ended was he contributorily negligent because a reasonably prudent person would make sure that the lights on his or her vehicle were working before he drives at night where he might get rear-ended if somebody didn't see him that's what brake lights are for so that there's a, that's a classic circumstance right what if the individual that we're trying to determine was uh, whether they were contributorily negligent or not what if that individual is a child what a good question john (laughs) the the law of virginia and i didn't pull out the jury instruction but it's emblazoned in my brain from having dealt with it for so many years 
it's a common sense rule in Virginia, and you can quibble about both the, the age limitations and you can quibble about presumptions and what people should know or not know, and there are some exceptions to the rule. But essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong on the exact ages, but ages zero to seven, infants basically, are deemed in Virginia not to be capable of contributory negligence. So if a young child, a three-year-old on a tricycle, rides out into traffic and gets hit, you can't escape liability because the three-year-old was contributorily negligent by driving out into traffic. What did you say, Peter, th- through seven? Through seven. Through, it's actually uh, plaintiff under seven. Under seven. Okay, yeah. so it's through six, right. under seven years old. And then seven to 14, subject to John correcting me on those exact years, the child of that age is presumed not to be capable of contributory negligence. And so, the presumption can be overcome, but it's not easily done. Right, and you get into all kinds of what, what, how strong is the presumption and what are the circumstances, and that's a case-by-case analysis. And then over 14, the child, and I say child because what we mean is under the age of 18, not an adult yet, but a older child, and some people would call young adult, but technically not an adult yet. The law still refers to them as infants. Yeah, the law has got to... Insults them and calls them infants, uh, but that 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 age group is presumed to be capable of contributory negligence. And there, there's a there was an interesting case that came down in Loudoun County, uh, where the son of the then superintendent of schools had been with a friend. He was a first or second year driver, and he was uh, down in Ashburn Flats, and he came over a slight rise. And his vehicle had run out of gas, and he was in the last fumes and was going along at an extremely slow speed, if not with the motor running. Now, it wasn't running much. He was, I think he was trying to ease his way to what was then Don's Exxon, uh, not very far away. And a dump truck in the other lane was behind another truck, and he swung out into the passing lane to... Uh, go past this slower moving dump truck and there was this nearly stopped vehicle in front of him and he creamed that vehicle and uh, the young man who was the superintendent's son died and and the case was tried twice it was successfully tried the first time on behalf of the claimant uh, by a very talented lawyer here in northern virginia and the very capable defense counsel appealed or, or filed a post-trial motion initially and in that post-trial motion he alleged that the judge instruction judge's instruction that the driver the young teenage driver's conduct should be judged based on what a any reasonably prudent young teenager would do under the circumstance uh, was a improper instruction. The defense said, no, a dry, a licensed driver in Virginia, regardless of how old you are when you get your license, everybody should be held to exactly the same standard. The judge, the trial judge, wrote a lengthy opinion in response to that motion, at, to which many lawyers to this day, this happened about 20 years ago, to this day, uh, call it the I erred, I erred, I erred opinion, in which the judge said, yeah, I made a mistake. I was wrong uh, during trial, and in the heat of trial, I allowed that instruction. The instruction really should be that all drivers are held to the same standard, and he ordered a new trial. They tried the case again, and the defendant won, Mm -hmm. which was something that all of us who were watching such heavyweight trial attorneys try cases paid a lot of attention to. But that's a good example of how the standard can be applied and how sometimes it can work for or against an individual. There are other limitations on how one's negligence can be assessed. There are forms of strict liability where if somebody gets hurt under certain circumstances, it's virtually impossible for 
the claimant to have been at fault in any way. Those are rare occasions. Contributory negligence in circumstances uh, like medical malpractice is a rare bird because the claimant, the patient, is usually just following orders and is just can't be involved in the actual treatment and the treatment decision such that they're having any impact on on the outcome. Now, a, a patient, as, as so many do, as we all know from time to time, will not follow a doctor's instructions and will not necessarily take medications that have been prescribed, etc. In those circumstances, you're really talking about mitigation of damages, which is a whole other subject. This, the contributory negligence has to happen at the same time as the primary negligence. So if you think about it in a surgical setting, the plaintiff is asleep at the time he or she's getting surgery. It is impossible in any circumstance I can think of for that individual to be contributorily negligent. Now, when the patient wakes up and the doctor says, do not get out of bed for three days and do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that. When that individual pops out of bed on day one and falls down and further injures him or herself, it's not because they were contributorily negligent in the care that the doctor originally gave. It's because it's because they failed to follow the doctor's orders. So were they to say, gee, the surgeon didn't do my surgery right. He nicked an artery or he nicked the bowel and I got this great infection and one thing and another. They could recover for that which is attributable to the surgeon's negligence and not recover for any damages that were incurred by virtue of their failure to follow proper instructions with respect to their injury. Am I making sense, John? It does make sense, and that begins to overlap with another subject area that maybe we can talk about some other time, which would be um, the duty to mitigate damages. Yeah, well. that, that's a whole area unto yep. itself. And frankly, the discussion of medical malpractice cases, it, it being such a different uh, breed of cat and being subject to so many different modifying rules in Virginia that we will uh, bore our listeners with that topic on a later date. And, and, I, and I'm going to bore our listeners just with a, one other really quick thing. Um, there was one type of comparative fault that we neglected to cover, and I do not want to uh, leave out the great state of South Dakota, the only state in the country that practices what is called slight slash gross negligence comparative plaintiff is barred from any recovery for anything other than slight negligence well let, let, let me jump in on that real quick that's, that's an odd <laughs> odd way of putting it slight negligence i know i, I, I bring it up it, this is a, it's a little bit of an odd ball point but it's just interesting i thought i've never heard of that before yeah correct me if i'm wrong john but if i'm not mistaken in virginia you cannot be contributorily negligent uh, in the face of gross negligence on the part of the defendant. Right. So, and gross negligence is where one's conduct isn't just outside of what an ordinarily prudent person would do. The conduct shocks the conscience. Right. And that kind of conduct that is so outrageous and is usually the subject of a claim for punitive damages, that is damages to punish the individual, not just compensate the person that was hurt, but to actually punish the wrongdoer. The law says that it doesn't matter whether the plaintiff was contributorily negligent if the defendant was grossly negligent and so much so that it shocks the conscience, that's what gross negligence right. is, that we're not going to prevent a recovery because the plaintiff might have contributed to the negligence i'll but tell you one other at, at least in virginia we don't have to litigate what slight negligence means no and i know <laughs> I, I think we all know what negligence is i read the instruction that that should carry the day it has for more than 100 years in virginia and and uh, for any number of reasons not to insult my friends in south dakota but i, I don't know what i don't know what slight means that's just an invitation for lawyers to write briefs and spend too much time in front of supreme court justices we've got plenty of things as it is that's right. So on another date, we'll talk about some of the impact of Good Samaritans and emergent care and other exceptions to uh, contributory negligence. But 
hopefully today uh, we brought a little bit of clarity to how contributory negligence works in Virginia and basically why it's unfair to most claimants. And it would be a whole lot better if Virginia would adopt comparative negligence. But I don't think we're going to see it in my career, maybe in yours. One day. We'll keep our fingers crossed. One day, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you, John. Thank you for listening to Law & Community, a podcast from Burnett & Williams. If you have any questions or wish to learn more, please leave us a message at our website, www.burnettwilliams.com. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening to. Don't forget to follow our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Burnett Williams and give us a call at 703-777-1650 for any questions you have. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next time, take care.